Anyway, I think it's time for us to go ahead and turn on over to Ann Bennett. Ann, are you ready? Take us on a on a ex exploration of Laurel's history. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just go ahead and I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Sean. I'm really happy to work with Sean in, in Howard County again. Um, my name is Ann Bennett. So like you can see, I'm the executive director of the Laurel Historical Society. Uh, my background is in history, museums, archaeology, and education. Uh, and I'm entering just about my fourth year here at the Laurel Historical Society. So I'm still learning a lot. And I'm really excited to share with you some of the stories uh, and history that I've learned the past couple of years as well. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please put them into the, the question box or the chat box and uh, Sean can uh, help me uh, see those to answer them, but please feel free to interrupt at any time. All right, so let's, uh, let's get into it. So I thought what I would do before we talk about the actual stories is give you just a brief uh, introduction to Laurel and our history to kind of set the stage for the stories that you'll hear in just a little bit. So Laurel is in many ways a town of firsts and onlys and it owes its existence to its prime location. It's along the Patuxent River and it's almost smack dab in the middle between Baltimore and Washington DC. And um, it's in four counties right now, but it, it, it was only Prince George's County when it, when it first started. So the historic district and the museum itself uh, is in Prince George's County, but uh, in modern times, in these 150 years, it has expanded to include Anne Arundel, Howard, Montgomery, uh, and of course, Prince George's. Um, let me just okay. see if I can, there we go get just my video showing. Okay, and so I'm sure if you are familiar with Howard County history that you know the name Snowden, right? You've driven by Snowden River Parkway uh, and pretty much everywhere you go in this area, you encounter some Snowden something or another. Uh, and that's for good reason. The Snowden family owned just about 10,000 acres of land in this area. Their main house is the Montpelier Mansion in South Laurel. So just a little bit further from where I am today at the Historical Society. Uh, but like everything else in this area, Laurel was a Snowden property. And in 1811, Nicholas Snowden had a grist mill here on the site of the Laurel, of the Laurel Cotton Mill, the, the graphic that you can see in the slide here. Uh, about a decade after that, it was converted from a grist mill to a cotton mill. And then by the late 1830s, it was taken over by the Patuxent Manufacturing Company and turned into uh, the cotton mill, the Laurel Cotton Mill. Uh, and as you can see, their offerings were greatly expanded. Uh, the Patuxent Manufacturing Company and the Laurel Cotton Mill were managed by Horace Caprin, uh, who was uh, Nicholas Snowden's son-in-law, <laughs> uh, his daughter. Uh, Oops, I'm having trouble with my video, Sean. Give me one second here. I'll see you at 5.30. Yeah, just a reminder just to mute yourself if possible, because uh, there's a little bit of feedback on my end as well. Um, so like I was saying, so Horace Caprin managed the Laurel Cotton Mill. He actually also managed the mill at Savage. So there is a Howard County connection there as well to Laurel. Uh, and this mill produced uh, what is called cotton duck, which is kind of a, a very heavily tightly woven canvas that was perfect for the sales of the Baltimore clipper ships at this time and also used for the coverings on Conestoga wagons going out west. So it was uh, in very heavy demand at this time. Uh, but, uh, oops, I went a little too far. The mill was pretty successful over its entire run. It did burn down in 1855, but it was rebuilt. And it actually stayed in production for some of the Civil War. It did close down uh, during part of it. Uh, but then it reopened and it was fairly successful. It had different sales and different owners uh, until it finally closed in 1929 uh, completely. Uh, all these mill buildings that you see here, this is one of our most iconic images of the Laurel Cotton Mill. 
uh, taking closer to the turn of the century. You can see the dam and the rivers in the background. Uh, and if you look to the back right uh, in the tree line there, all those buildings, that's Howard County. <laughs> so uh, you can see just how close we are uh, physically uh, and also how close we are related. So all of these buildings that you see here, they were demolished after 1929. And in its place, a private swim club uh, segregated to the public uh, was opened uh, and it remains uh, in practice uh, for uh, quite a few decades. Uh, but I do have a story for that and we'll get to that at the end of my talk here. Uh, like I said, uh, Prince George's County, uh, Laurel is in Prince George's County and it was Prince George's County's only mill town. It was really the only town that was based on industrial economy. And the Laurel Cotton Mill was not Laurel's only mill. This is the Avondale Mill and it was a little further uh, into town um, along kind of in the 4th Street area. Uh, and it was built in 1845. It was managed by Horace Capron as well. And this was successful as well. It originally started as a flour mill. Uh, it continued operation as a cotton mill and it produced a different type of cotton though. This was more like a finer cotton. They also did lace embroidery. And during the First World War, they embroidered uh, like chevrons and kind of uh, ribbon decorations for army uniforms. Uh, so it was in operation for quite a few years as well. Um, it, and it was in existence up until 1991 when it tragically and accidentally burned to the ground. And the, there is nothing left of this today except for the foundation. Uh, and this was a huge blow to the history of Laurel and to the historic community because uh, without Avondale Mill standing, there were only a few random buildings related to the Laurel Cotton Mill and that early industrial history of Laurel. And this is one of those random buildings. <laughs> so most of what we see associated with the Cotton Mill and Laurel's uh, industrial economy are the mill workers housing. So there is a couple blocks where you can see either stone or brick buildings that originally held the families that worked at the Cotton Mill. And the Laurel Museum is one of those buildings. Most of the buildings are privately owned as uh, single family residents uh, or some multifamily uh, apartment units as well. The Laurel Museum is the only one that is publicly accessible to the public. And the only other type of structure related to the cotton mill that uh, you can see and, and, and is still in existence uh, is part of the dam that they had, they had built in 1850 to control the flow of the water from the Patuxent River to help with the operation of the Laurel Cotton Mill. So I love this picture because this was actually turned into a postcard and everything about this caption in the postcard is wrong. It is not the oldest house in Laurel and it was not built in 1802. So uh, again, as you, you know, hear and go through your historical research, you always have to take things uh, with a grain of salt. But I like it because it shows part of this history of the transition of the Laurel Museum building when those mill workers housing was first built in the late 1830s and 1840s, they actually held four families. So look at this picture with me and kind of, kind of be amazed by how many people lived in this building. There were two families on the second floor that had access to the attic space. You can see the little windows on the side there. And then two families on the first floor and they were all in separate units so they didn't have to go into each other's quarters and then each had a quarter of the basement for their kitchen areas and their cooking areas over the years like we can see in this picture it was changed into a duplex uh, and then by the 1970s the last private residents uh, left the building it was abandoned uh, and then in the 1990s it was renovated, uh, purchased by the city of Laurel and given to the Laurel Historical Society for our home. And it is now home to the Laurel Museum. Uh, the Laurel Historical Society had been in existence since 1975. So for just about um, 20 years, it was kind of homeless in terms of its uh, collection storage and activities. But in that time, they, uh, they did so many tours. They did garden tours, they did walking tours, they did uh, different types of programming uh, and uh, one of the things that is great is the Laurel Museum is kind of I like to say a triple threat so we are a historic house museum but um, actually raise your hand have you ever been to the Laurel Museum 
Yes. Okay. Yes, Sean, of course. I'm <laughs> I hope your hand is going to be raised. Uh, well, that's good. I'm, I'm seeing a couple hands, so that's excellent. Uh, and I invite you, if you have not been, that uh, fingers crossed we will be reopening soon. We tentatively are planned to reopen again in June. So I invite you to come and see for yourself some of the exhibit pieces that I'll be sharing with you uh, in, just, uh, in just a little bit as well. So this, it, and so I said, so triple threat, so going back to that, um, it's a historic house museum but it's not interpreted as a historic house museum because just about every year we have a new exhibit on display. And if you were part of uh, the, the, his, the Howard County walking tour uh, or the, the holiday tour, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have seen the uh, healthcare exhibits. Uh, this current year uh, is a leftover from the 2020 exhibits. Uh, so it changes every year. And we're really happy to be able to take those deep dives into Laurel history and not just kind of have a recreation of what life was like in the 1840s. Uh, we are a historical society. So uh, during pre-pandemic times, we are served as a research facility open to the public. Uh, and we are a small museum physically <laughs> uh, and organizationally. We are a staff of one and a half. Uh, and we rely on our volunteer corps as well. Uh, so this is the Laurel Museum. And so what I thought what I would do now is talk to you about, I'll say our current exhibit because we're not uh, quite open yet. And uh, it was intended to be put up um, last year for, for the 2020 exhibit. So I, I will get to the 150 and the anniversary year in just a second. Um, but I wanted to let you know that Unpacking Laurel's Past 150 Years on Display uh, is the most current exhibit and that's the one that we had opened uh, last year. And that's the one that with a little bit of tweaking, uh, we're going to be excited to open uh, hopefully next month as well. So if you've been listening to me and you're not uh, nodding off at this point, you'll, and you're doing the math, you'll be thinking, okay, well, 150 years from 1811, doesn't get us to 2021 or 1845. Uh, so what are the 150 years? You know, where, where are we starting from and where are we, we counting from? So we are counting from 1870 to 2020 last year. So this was our logo. This was one of our uh, introduction graphics for unpacking Laurel's past 150 years on display. So that was supposed to be the big anniversary exhibit for Laurel's 150th. And again, I just went through all of these decades of history so you know that Laurel was in existence for quite a few decades before 1870. So what is so important about that year? 1870 was the year that Laurel okay. was incorporated as the, uh, oh, uh, what's that? And those people are oh, I thought that was a question. Okay. <laughs> I will, I will continue. Uh, so to, just to um, finish that, so the 1870 date is so important because that was the date that Laurel was incorporated as a city. So what does that mean? Incorporation means that Laurel could raise its own taxes, uh, levy fines, uh, it could make its own laws, and it could um, make its own police force and fire and rescue operations. So it really was an important milestone as a community. Uh, so from 1870, April 4th, 1870 to be uh, precise, uh, that is what we are celebrating. And it's like everything else, uh, it just kind of fizzled out. We have this great exhibit opening and we were open for six weeks before we had to close to the pandemic. Uh, and all of these huge anniversary celebrations uh, so many organizations in town had great things planned, uh, and they were they were canceled, uh, unfortunately. But we did uh, have our exhibit opening, and like I said, we're going to use that as the foundation to reopen it again next month. So this is a copy of the charter from uh, the the in, the act that. Um, incorporated the city of Laurel on April 4th, 1870. Uh, and there's two copies that we know about. Uh, we do not actually have a copy. <laughs> we have a copy of a copy, but the Maryland State Archives has uh, a, a scanned copy of it. And the city of Laurel actually has the a copy of the charter uh, in their archives, which is a, a different experience, but uh, they are in the process of getting it conserved so that we would have a, a nice local copy as well. Uh, and I know there's a lot of writing on this page and it actually 
Uh, you can see that it says approved April 4th, 1870 on the lower right there, but it actually goes on for quite a few pages after that. And I want to actually put this out to you. You can either use this in the chat box or maybe unmute yourself uh, if nobody talks too much over each other at the time. But I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think Laurel's first legislation was? Remember I said incorporation meant that they could pass their own laws. So what do you think the very first law on the book for the city of Laurel was in 1870? And if you want to put it into the chat, you can do that. Or you can raise your hands. Okay, so we have a guess about, yeah, making it a dry city, regulating alcohol. Uh, no, that's, that's a very good guess. And we do see later in uh, the 1890s and uh, closer to the turn of the century as well, uh, that there were uh, regulations about selling alcohol, especially on Sundays um, and on taxes. Uh, taxes is close, but it wasn't um, necessarily personal taxes. The legislation was about hogs. The first law that the city of Laurel passed was to regulate uh, pigs running wild through the streets of Laurel and into other people's property. So you can imagine what was <laughs> what the city of Laurel of like was like in 1870 if that was the very first thing on their mind and what the pig situation uh, was in Laurel if uh, you had to actually make a law uh, that said you had to control your pigs and you have to uh, can enclose and can can contain them so they're on your property. So we thought that was kind of a, a funny story uh, in, in the history of Laurel's incorporation. Uh, so this is just a panoramic uh, picture that I took, and this is will kind of show you the different sections of our exhibit. So this is in the East Gallery, and we broke up the anniversary years thematically. So you can see uh, maybe a couple words here and there. So we broke it into sections like community, transportation, business, home, faith, um, entertainment. So we did kind of a thematic approach. We were debating whether we should do a chronological approach, go by decades. And one of the things that we were talking about too was when we were naming the exhibit, we're thinking like, oh, well, it would be really cool if we had 150 objects for 150 years. That would be so cool. And when we were thinking more about that idea, we're like, well, that's a lot of work. We have to take them out of storage. We have to mount them. We have to monitor them. We have to write captions for them. And then more importantly, we got to put it all back when we're done at the end of this exhibit. So 150 is way too much. So I'm going to open it up again in the chat, or if you wanted to unmute yourself, how many objects do you think we actually ended up with? You can take a wild guess. I'm sorry, I don't have any prizes to offer you, but um, so we did not end up with 150 objects. How many do you think we ended up with? Any guesses? We actually, oh, I hear, I see one chat, 170. Um, 7,000. 7, uh, it feels like 7,000 sometimes. We actually ended up with 306 objects. So we, this is coming from the committee that said 150 objects is too much. We, we just about doubled that. Although to be fair, that does include things like scanned and digitized graphics that we included on our text panels. So you can see on some of these, for example, we have the picture of that charter. We have that scanned and printed on the text panel. We don't actually have the charter itself on display. Uh, but we still had to access it, uh, scan it, make it print out, and then still write the caption for it. So it was just about, just about as much as work if we had displayed all 306 items. Okay, so what I thought I would do is to go through, like I said, and share the stories behind some of the objects that we have put on display in the last couple of exhibits that we did since essentially since I started uh, here as executive director. So again, raise your hands or put into the chat box if you know the Laurel Meat Market. Have, if you have been here, if you've seen it before. Okay, good. I see some nods, I see some hands. Yeah, so even, you know, crossing over into Prince George's County, if you've driven through Laurel, uh, the meat market is pretty iconic. And it's actually a really important 
historical landmark to Laurel as well, not just for the cows, uh, but because it was originally the site of the Divin Foundry, which was an important component of the cotton mill uh, manufacturing uh, for many years. After that, it was turned into a grocery store, an A&P grocery store. Uh, and then for about, I wanna say two decades, it was, a Vogue, it was called the Vogue Dress Shop uh, along Main Street. Uh, the Vogue dress shop moved out in the 1950s to the Laurel Shopping Center, which is all along Route 1 now where the Giant is, if you're familiar with that. And, and then after that, uh, it went back to the type of uh, grocery store meat markets. And from 1970 until 2018, when uh, Billy uh, Miles uh, retired before, yeah, I mean, I actually passed away last year as well. Sadly, uh, this was the Laurel Meat Market, and it was, you know, famous uh, for its meats and its uh, pies and its offerings here along Main Street. Uh, and it was also famous for this huge fiberglass cow <laughs> that was out front, and you can see in one of our collection pictures is decorated for Christmas. And so this is kind of a very kind of fun, serendipitous behind the scenes museum story. I was meeting the one of my board members for coffee uh, at SIP, just right down the street from the meat market uh, after they retired and they were cleaning out the shop. And she saw those two uh, plush cows that had been inside the meat market for again, like 30, 40 years. Uh, and they were just gonna throw them out. So she's like, can we have them for our collection? And they're like, of course, <laughs> because we don't want them. Uh, and let me tell you, they looked like they had been there for the last 30 years. They were very dusty, they were dirty. Uh, and so we cleaned them up and we have uh, the black and white one in our 2020 or in slash 2021 uh, exhibit this year. So uh, if you come over, you can um, pat the little meat market cow on his head uh, and say um, that you were part of the, the the iconography of Laurel. Um, okay, so this is good. So I want to turn your attention to uh, the picture on the left first because that segues nicely from the last slide that I talked to you about. Remember I said the Vogue dress shop moved from Main Street Laurel to the Laurel Shopping Center. This is the early stages of the Laurel Shopping Center, that aerial view on the left-hand side. Um, Oh, the question, what happened to the big cow out front of the market? We sadly did not get the fiberglass cow. We actually asked them if we could get it when they uh, retired and, and went out of business. Uh, but they took the cow and there was a chicken uh, and I think a pig as well. They were all fiberglass. They went back to the Miles family and they went into their front yard for a while. Uh, I'm not sure where they ended up right now, but uh, we, we sadly did not get them. So they went back to the Miles family. Um, but uh, so this picture was an, an aerial picture taken and you can see the, the giant food uh, there in the corner. The Laurel Shopping Center opened in 1956 in just kind of like this little L configuration. It later expanded to have a different wing on it. Uh, and this was part of the expansion, the commercial expansion of Laurel in the 50s. So kind of that post-war boom. Laurel boomed right along with it and expanded. And suddenly people were not shopping on Main Street anymore. Uh, and this was actually also a huge, um, I guess, um, a new point of access for the African, Amer African American community of the Grove in Laurel, because there were a lot of shops along Main Street that they were discriminated against and they were not allowed to shop there. So when the commercial hub kind of moved away from Main Street, uh, to these large shopping centers, they had more opportunities to shop. And the Laurel Shopping Center was home to small stores that later became local chains uh, or um, national chains that had a headquarters or had a facility in Laurel, like People's Drug, for example. Uh, so that is the Laurel Shopping Center. So somewhere in there, the Vogue Dress Shop uh, located in the late 50s. But behind that, uh, I'm just going to call your attention to the uh, building and the kind of the fields in the back because we're going to move uh, to that in our next slide. Uh, but that is the Laurel Sanitarium and part of it uh, before it was demolished. And uh, the reason that I have the aerial picture of the shopping center juxtaposed to the cover of the Life magazine is because uh, this is one of Laurel's kind of claims to fame. Remember I said that Laurel is in a lot of ways uh, a city of firsts and onlys and most of those are really good. We have the first public library in Prince George's County, the first national bank in the county, the first public high school, 
uh, our volunteer fire department, remember from the incorporation, they are one of the oldest and most active in the county. But there's uh, also something that is not great and that we get asked about a lot, whether this is on display or not. And that is the 1972 assassination attempt on George Wallace. So this happened in May 1972. Um, I'm sure most of you know that Wallace was governor of Alabama. He was a very controversial uh, racist figure and he ran for president in 1972 and he stopped in Laurel to campaign. Uh, so he with his entourage um, so he had his with his entourage was at uh, the Laurel Shopping Center to kind of campaign and give speeches and uh, there there was an assassination attempt and he was shot along with three people in his entourage and uh, taken I think to I want to say Silver Springs uh, somewhere outside of Laurel. Uh, so he survived but he was permanently uh, paralyzed and that ended his campaign uh, for presidency. Uh, and so this was this was huge news. This snapped Laurel right way to the national forefront. Uh, there was local as well as national press coverage, and it made the cover of the Life magazine uh, from 1872 as well. Uh, this is one of the items that people frequently donate to us. I would say we have at least four copies in our collection, and we have other copies that people want to give us, and we always have to either turn them away uh, if they're, you know, lesser quality than what we have already. Uh, but the one that, that always stands out among all of those copies is the autographed version of the Life magazine. So not only do we have the copy of the Wallace shooting for that took place in Laurel, uh, but one of our former members uh, from the 1970s, uh, he asked George Wallace to autograph it, and George Wallace did. So you can see kind of in the white part of his shirt, uh, you can see that it's signed by George Wallace, the cover of the Life magazine that shows him getting uh, shots in Laurel. So uh, that's a wild story. Uh, I love it for the autograph version that, that one of our members had, I guess, the audacity to ask him to sign it and that he did. Uh, but that kind of completes uh, the circle of, of the stories uh, behind this incident and kind of, you know, one of the black marks on Laurel's history as well. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the sanitarium then. And so this is, these are pictures from our 2019 exhibit on healthcare and medicine in Laurel. So if you go back uh, to that aerial picture that I showed you at the shopping center. Uh, you can see that there was a big building in the background. It was kind of surrounded by fields uh, before the shopping center uh, kind of, you know, expanded and took it over. Uh, that area now is the Laurel Town Center where uh, the, um, the theater is and uh, Mission Barbecue and uh, all, the, all those shops in there at that time. But uh, one of the things that really stood out from us from the feedback we got from the 2019 exhibit was the Laurel Sanitarium. Nobody knew that there was a sanitarium in Laurel and that it had existed for so long. So there actually wasn't just one sanitarium in Laurel over the decades, there were actually four. Uh, and it started in a building that was the Leslie Hotel. And this was on Fifth Street where Talbot and Compton kind of come together. So it's kind of in the center I think west. <laughs> I'm not sure what direction it is, but you know, kind of heading, heading out so uh, off of 198 toward West Laurel. Uh, and so it was the Leslie Hotel, and then it was taken over by the Keeley Institute, uh, the Springer Sanitarium, and then finally the Brewster Park Sanitarium, all in that location. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily for the treatment of like mental disorders, kind of what we commonly associate sanitariums with. It was mostly for the treatment of addictions and kind of like nervous disorders associated with it. Um, and so that's kind of what they, they treated over, uh, over the years. And locally, the sanitarium was also a very large employer of uh, African-Americans uh, in Laurel as well. Uh, they had, uh, if they didn't get, uh, employment as domestic help or as teachers. Uh, they usually had to go elsewhere closer to uh, Beltstone College Park in you know, Washington DC for work. So this was uh, another um, local employer for the African-American community. 
Uh, but you'll, so this, uh, the picture in the background is uh, the Leslie Hotel. Uh, and then, so what's the connection between Fifth Street and Laurel and the shopping center area that I showed you? Well, they actually picked up the darn thing and moved it a half mile. So it took them five months, but they picked up the, the hotel building, the sanitarium building, completely furniture, clocks, dishes, everything, picked it up, moved it five, um, five months, one uh, half mile. Uh, to the site where you saw it in that aerial picture. Uh, and they had added to, there was a mansion already on the property and then they added a modern building uh, in the 50s. And it was run at that time by Dr. Jesse Coggins from about 1909 until his death in 1963. Uh, but by that time he had kind of farmed out a lot of the treatment to organizations like Alcoholics Anonymous, and it really had transitioned as well to mostly just elder care at that point. So there were just a very few elderly patients that had been lifelong residents from 1910 on, uh, and they, they were transitioned to different facilities. Uh, and then in 1963, the Laurel Volunteer Fire Department, our, our active uh, longest running fire department in the county, uh, they burned it as uh, kind of an experiment. <laughs> so uh, the Laurel Sanitarium was no more. And then that allowed the expansion again of the commercial shopping area along Route 1 there. Uh, but people are, again are very surprised that there was a sanitarium in Laurel uh, and that it was in two different locations. And uh, before we move on, I just want to call your attention to that Brewster Park Sanitarium. Uh, and this is a wonderful little hidden story, and it's really just a blip on the history of Laurel, which is a shame. So Brewster Park Sanitarium was named after Dr. Flora Brewster. She was a female surgeon, a female uh, gynecologist, a physician, a homeopath and a suffragist. And she came to Baltimore to help in a gynecological practice before taking over her own. Uh, she established the Homeopath Advocates, uh, which is kind of a natural medicine journal for lay people. Uh, and she published that with the help of her sister who was also a doctor. Uh, and so she came to Laurel from Baltimore to open the Brewster Park Sanitarium. And unfortunately it was short lived. She ran into financial difficulties and it closed uh, within a year. She moved out to Seattle because she herself had health issues. And then she died tragically in a home gas explosion in 1919, uh, one year before um, the, the passage of the 19th Amendment, uh, which is a shame because she was such a vocal uh, suffragist in Baltimore. Uh, and she is a phenomenal woman. And even though she just has a little connection to the history of Laurel, I think it's a huge, huge impact. And it was such a great uh, opportunity to know this woman and, and to now be able to tell her story more. Uh, okay, so talking about suffragists, <laughs> then uh, this is also something that we had on display in the 2020 exhibit. Uh, so on the left, you'll see we had a pop-up display from the National Archives called Rightfully Hers, uh, which talked about uh, the passage of the 19th Amendment. And you can see my reproduction Votes for Women sash that I made and a couple items in our collection that support uh, suffrage and uh, voting. Uh, and so two of those books kind of flanking the ballot in the middle are the 1922 and the 1928 uh, poll book for the city of Laurel elections. And what's so phenomenal, especially about the 1922 poll book, is that that was the very first city of Laurel election that Laurel women could vote in. So they didn't have an election in 20 or 21, uh, but in 22, that was the very first one that they could vote in after the passage of the 19th. And so uh, it's very um, inspiring to see the list of all those women uh, voters uh, listed uh, in that poll book. So I will warn you, this is my current obsession, uh, tracking down the history of women's suffrage in Laurel. And I will try my best to keep it just at like two minutes for this slide. But most people don't know the history of suffrage in Laurel, myself included. When I came to the Historical Society, I was told that there wasn't much about the history because the editor of the Laurel Leader, which is our local newspaper, actually still in existence today, uh, he was against suffrage. So there was very little written about women's suffrage for decades, uh, other than a few letters to the editor here and there. Uh, or maybe a few blurbs about international suffrage activity, like the Pankhursts 
uh, in London and a lot of the international activities, but there was very little written about suffrage activity in Laurel, which is a huge shame because Laurel um, had a ton of suffrage activity and, you know, to use that word hotbed uh, is very exciting because the more I dig, the more I find. Uh, so Laurel, because of its prime location on Route 1, uh, was the site of an overnight camp from the Women's um, Army of the Hudson. So there was a group of women uh, led by Rosalie Gardner Jones uh, from New York City who marched over 200 miles from New York City to Washington, D.C. on the eve of the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson uh, for his first term to urge women uh, to urge for women for the right to vote for women. Uh, and they stayed uh, the night in Laurel. And it was from here that really two important things happened. They uh, sent the, their suffrage flag to Wilson, urging them, uh, urging him to take votes for women seriously. Uh, and it was also the first time that uh, black suffragists tried to join the army. So this was, you know, they had passed the Mason-Dixon uh, line. They were in Baltimore, it was a metropolitan uh, setting, but as they started going into Laurel and further, further into the South, this was the first time that there was a conflict. And uh, so this was a very important location, uh, location for this question of, you know, how are they dealing with uh, African American suffragists and how are they going to uh, take in their votes, but also not isolate the women, especially from the South, who were, uh, who were against uh, that and had huge, uh, you know, racist um, barriers to that as well. Um, but I did find uh, just recently that uh, on August 2nd, 1911, uh, was the charter date for the, um, the Suffrage Club in Laurel. They had a chapter of the Just Government League, uh, which was a suffrage um, organization in Maryland. Uh, and from then on, up until the passage of the 19th Amendment, they were very active getting uh, name, you know, name brand speakers, nationally recognized speakers, uh, like Reverend Dr. Anna Howard Shaw uh, and Dr. Lillian Welsh come to speak at Laurel. So, okay, that was probably more than two minutes, but like I said, it's my current obsession. If you want to hear anything more about suffrage, uh, I will talk to you for another hour about that uh, later on. Uh, so this picture is really great, and I think it's coming out a little blurry uh, on your end, so I do apologize about that. But we're looking at Main Street Laurel in about 1911, we think. And this is a nice transition from the suffrage because during that 1913 march from New York to DC, uh, they tried to stay overnight, the, the suffrage um, women tried to stay overnight in Laurel and the Laurel Hotel turned them away. They did not want the suffrage women staying at their hotel. Uh, luckily there was another hotel in town, the Cloverleaf Inn, uh, and they let the suffrage women uh, stay overnight there. Uh, but so the Laurel Hotel had this prime location at the corner of Route 1 uh, in Laurel. Uh, it was a hotel, it was also a restaurant, it served meals for quite a few years until it kind of uh, devolved in its reputation, allegedly becoming uh, a brothel <laughs> and a dive bar uh, until it was uh, demolished. So unfortunately, it uh, is just a parking lot today. But you can see that the Laurel Hotel is kind of in, in the corner of the picture here. And we have a big bunch of young men uh, in the picture. And what do you think that they are gathered for? Just throwing that out there, if anyone has any guesses. So this I already told you, it's 1911 in Laurel. Uh, doesn't actually have anything to suffer with suffrage. I'll, I'll give you that uh, hint. But what do you think they're lined up to do? Okay, you probably won't be able to see. Uh, it's a little blurry, but a couple of the gentlemen have number bibs. Yes, Ellen. They, yes, race, foot race. Okay, there you go. Yes, they have numbered bibs on. So this was the start of a marathon. So for years, the Laurel Hotel was the starting line for annual marathons between Main Street Laurel up to Baltimore or down to DC. That's about 20 miles in each direction. So it's the perfect length for a marathon run. And they held these every year between 1909 and 1939. And, and they were sanctioned by the AAU, the Amateur Athletic uh, Union. Uh, and eventually they were actually used as qualifiers uh, for the US Olympic team. 
So in, in that kind of 30 year period, uh, again, we have connections to national events uh, and national figures as well. Uh, so we think this is about 1911 in the very early years of the Laurel Marathon. So good, good guesses, everyone. Okay, so uh, this is more of a just because story. <laughs> and, and the reason is just because I love it. It's my favorite piece on display that we had in the 2020 exhibit. And uh, it's holding up well. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, continue its exhibition for our reopening next month as well. Uh, so does anyone recognize the couple on the picture on the right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, Ike and Mimi Eisenhower. This picture is not from our collection, but the gown is. Uh, so Laurel has a couple brushes with presidents. Uh, in the 1840s, I want to say Zachary Taylor dined with Horace Capron uh, at his supervisor's house uh, near the mills. Uh, and because the piano railroad station went right through Laurel, uh, we know that Abraham Lincoln passed through on the train. So there's a couple brushes with presidents, uh, but our kind of tightest claim to fame is that uh, Dwight Eisenhower, before he was president, when he was still Lieutenant Colonel serving after World War I, uh, he was stationed at Fort Meade, which is you know just right next door to Laurel. And they had government housing, but they weren't really excited about it. So they were trying to fix up their quarters uh, to make it nicer for their family. And during that period, they actually rented an apartment at a boarding house in Laurel. So at 327 Montgomery Street, the house still stands today. Uh, the couple was actually um, in the middle of uh, renovating it again, which is very nice to keep that history up. Uh, but they rented a one room apartment at the Halverson boarding house. At the time, Mamie was not very excited <laughs> about the boarding house or Laurel, um, but kind of in later memoirs, uh, she does remember that she actually did come back to Laurel to uh, revisit some of the friends she had made during that time. So hopefully her opinion of Laurel kind of softened in that time. Um, so there, so layers and layers of donors later, we have one of Mimi's uh, gowns from the 1950s. So this is not from her time that she spent in Laurel after the World War, uh, but this is one of the gowns that she wore uh, during um, the presidency at the White House. Uh, and so it's not the gown in that picture to the right, uh, but you can see that uh, she definitely has a style that she likes and uh, she's kind of sticking to it. And this gown, as we were mounting it, as I kind of patted out the bodice and everything on the mannequin, it's really high end. It's a beautiful silk. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, internal straps and elastic cording to hold everything in place. And you can see it's just at the shoulders. You know, and she's not going to be moving around and trying to keep everything in place all night. So there were very, very high end couture finishes for the uh, seams for the zipper, for all the uh, like all the places uh, for the gathering of, of the silk um, gown. So it, it's very high end. And again, this is something that I could just talk a uh, long time about. But uh, I contacted the Presidential Library, the Eisenhower Library, and they didn't have any information about this specific dress. But she, but they did say that Mamie had uh, seamstresses in New uh, in New York and uh, DC that would work with her, uh, and that. Uh, so they would help make couture high-end gowns like this, but she also was not afraid to shop off the rack at places like J.C. Penney's, and so she would do that, and then her seams just would kind of tailor it more to her body, so she did like to bargain shop as well. All right, so just a couple more stories left, and then I will pass it uh, back over to Sean and answer any other questions that uh, may have come up. But I wanted to include this because this really was a last-minute addition to our exhibit and it's so fun and bright and colorful and again it's one of these things that you would just have no idea the things just come out of the blue sometimes so right before we were opening last february of 2020 we had this don these donations on these concert posters uh and an, and an autograph cowboy hats uh for the grand old opry uh circuit so this was a fundraiser for the Knights of Pythias. They're a charitable uh, fraternal organization. They're actually still active in Laurel. Um, so this is one of their fundraisers that they had in the, in the late 60s was to bring this Grand Ole Opry circuit to Laurel. And the location is really interesting too because 
it doesn't exist today. Uh, it's at the intersection of where 198 and the 95 interchange is now, kind of by Van Dusen. If you're going out west to like towards West Laurel and Burtonsville out that way, uh, and by kind of before you get to the hospital uh, road up there, nothing is left. You know, the interchange completely blew it out, but it used to be the location of a whole little community. Uh, it was called the Willis, uh, the Willis community. They had, they had a little one room schoolhouse, which we have some pictures of. They had a community park and a community center, and that's where these concerts were held. Uh, and then again, like we said, when the interchange came through, all of that was demolished. And it, with the exception of those couple school pictures and these posters, that's the, all the history that we know of the Willis community. So I think it's great because they brought in some big names like Porter Wagner and Mel Haggard came through on these tours. Uh, and it seemed like it's just a really great uh, fun time uh, to be had in Laurel. Um, okay, so this is the last story that I have. And uh, excuse my <laughs> the still of, of my face there. Uh, this is a still from one of the videos we did. And I thought it's kind of a, a good, um, introduction for me to remember that we do have a YouTube channel, the Laurel Historical Society has a YouTube channel, and we do have what I call one take tours. Uh, so if you wanted to hear some more about uh, the exhibit that we have on display and that will be reopening next month, uh, just go to our YouTube channel, you can hear those one take tours, and you can hear the story of this pool token as well. So I'm going to zip through this. Um, but it, what's in that little flip case and what you see there uh, closer up on the right hand side is um, it's a pool token. I actually have it right here. <laughs> you can see it's not very much bigger than a quarter. And this little tiny item has such a huge history. Remember that I said when the uh, when the mill was demolished that they put in a pool, but it was a private privately owned pool and it was segregated. The black residents of Laurel could not swim there. Uh, and it was constructed in the 40s and it was in operation in the 50s uh, all the way into the late 60s. They raised money for the construction of the pool by holding minstrel shows. Uh, and if you don't know, minstrel shows are just kind of a variety show where white performers put on blackface uh, and kind of sing and dance. And so we have several programs from those minstrel shows of really racist caricature cartoons on the cover. We actually have a picture of the performers from one of the years, I think 1938. Um, I, I, I had to be in the 40s, I'm sorry, but uh, one of the years. Uh, so the entire cast was in blackface. And so we have a picture of those as well. And again, that kind of you know, how do we interpret the, this terrible, racist, uncomfortable, uncomfortable history? Um, we actually put a copy of the minstrel program on display in our exhibit because we want it to be uh, a storyteller. We want it to be empowering. We don't want to hide that history, uh, but we want it to be used to say that this is not okay. Uh, even though it was an acceptable form of entertainment back then, it shouldn't have been, and it's not okay now. Um, and what they what they did was was wrong, and we need to talk about why it's wrong and how it happens and how it ended. Uh, and how it ended is the story of this little pool token. So um, during the summer of 1967, uh, there was a lot of Ku Klux Klan activity in Laurel. They burned um, some crosses, they burned businesses, they terrorized uh, the residents of the Grove. Uh, and then after that period, the Grove Community Association worked very closely with the city of Laurel to have these list of improvements that they wanted. They needed community space. Uh, they wanted to be safe. They wanted to have access to things like the library and for recreation activities. Uh, so the pool was the focal point of that improvement. So the city of Laurel bought the private swim club from the owners. They closed it down, they renovated it, and they opened it as a fully integrated, desegregated uh, swim club that is still open right across the, the road from the museum today. Uh, and that pool token uh, dates from uh, at least 1967 uh, back, uh, you know, in time because uh, before that, uh, if you were a black resident of Laurel, you wouldn't have needed the pool token because you couldn't get into the pool. Uh, so we think that this just has such a huge, impactful, hopeful story, uh, you know, in this little, little tiny object. So. Um, 
that's all the stories that I have. I just wanted to put a shameless plug <laughs> for some of the items that we have associated with it. So uh, if you want your very own version of the Laurel Meat Market, for example, we have them as ornaments. So we try to do a Christmas ornament every year. Um, we do have a Laurel vintage map pillow. Uh, it has Savage in there in quite a few uh, cities in Howard County as well. Uh, so we have that for sale on our online shop. Uh, and a lot of the stories um, kind of overlap with the publication that the Laurel History Boys did of their uh, Laurel at 150 book. So uh, we're one of the sites uh, where you can purchase that online uh, or in store uh, as well. And Sean can always tell you more information about that. Um, and if you have any questions or follow up, I'm happy to talk to you now or at any time. And if you want to talk about um, historic costuming or women's suffrage in Laurel, be prepared to set aside at least an hour to talk to me about it. <laughs> it's, I welcome any questions now uh, or at any time. So um, thank you. And Sean, I'll pass it back over to you. Yeah, and there were a couple of questions in the chat. Just want to make sure you were able to answer these. Ken had asked, why did the mill shut down during Civil War? Did you answer that question? Um, the mill shut down during the Civil War, uh, kind of a couple reasons. Um, there was there was always kind of the threat of of drought and, and like natural reasons that they were trying to regulate um, the river better, and that's why they, that's one of the reasons why they built the dam. So part of it was uh, natural reasons. Natural reasons they just uh, didn't have enough capacity to run it. Uh, the other reason was, again, you know, more for security reasons that the troops were stationed in Laurel to kind of guard the depot there. Uh, so that kind of made it difficult to get like commercial um, and raw materials and, and finished products in and out of Laurel. Um, and then, and also with um, uh, men volunteering and being recruited into the army uh, that impacted some of their, uh, you know, some of their employees as well. So uh, kind of with all of those different uh, reasons they, they closed the mill for about two years during the Civil War, but it opened up shortly after everything kind of went back to, to normal. Okay, the other question that I have here is, I don't know if this was answered either, what Barbara Tucker asked, what happened to the big cow out front of the market? Oh, yeah, I, I think I tried to answer that. Uh, so the big cow is fiberglass, and there was also a chicken and a pig, and they went back to the Miles family. So all the last I heard of them is that they went back to their to their house. I think they lived in Burkinsville, and like I said, Sally Billy Miles passed away um, last year. Um, so I'm not sure what happened to it now. We did not make a push for it. People were advocating that they donate it to us. So we didn't get the fiberglass cow, but we got the stuffed ones instead. Well, uh, if there are no other questions. Oh, I don't know about the horse at Gayers. I don't, I don't know about that. I, I would suspect uh, as well that it's either in one of the back rooms or it went with uh, the previous owners of that. But unfortunately it did not come to us as well, which is, which is good because you can see we're 1900 square feet all in. So we don't have much storage space for, for any oversized animals. I guess I have a question. How was your cemetery presentation last night? Oh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Wayne Davis gave us a presentation on the Guilford Quarry Cemetery, and that was the second time I had heard it. And I just keep getting amazed every time I hear it about all of the genealogical and historical research uh, that went into it. And I am hoping to go back out into the field again, because I would love to help them with that. Will that um, presentation be on your YouTube page, perchance? Yes, I will. Yes. Thank you for that nudge. Uh, yeah, so I still have to process it, but uh, all of our webinars are on there. So uh, so Wayne's talk uh, yesterday will be on there. Um, but we have also what we're calling collection conversations. So those are a little more informal uh, chat type conversations. Uh, and we have them on the Gardens of Laurel. So Mary Jerkowitz from Montpelier gave a talk about that. So if you're interested in learning more about the Snowdens and the Snowden family history, uh, and even the Muirkirk Iron Works uh, down in South Laurel, that's a great presentation. You can find that on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, going all the way back to, I think, uh, October when we joined the webinar bandwagon. So <laughs> you can see all of those recordings there. Wonderful. So um, that's great. Thank you so much, Anne. That was that was spectacular. Um, always a pleasure to work with our friends at the Laurel Historical Society. For those members who joined late, our next lunch lecture next June, uh, next month will be um, on June the 4th. 
and it will be on location at the Elkridge Furnace Inn, and there will be an opportunity if you are interested to reserve a table at the Elkridge Furnace Inn for that talk, which will be Lee Preston Jr., retired archaeologist, who will talk about the, um, the colonial iron industry uh, at Elkridge and the Ellicott Furnace that was down at, uh, at the Elkridge, Elkridge Furnace Inn site. That'll be on June the 4th. I will be sending out information very shortly, uh, as soon as I get it from Elkridge Furnison, with regards to how do you reserve a table, what the um, what the menu will be that day, and, and what the the cost will be. We'll, we'll get that out get that out soon. So, um, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank everyone um, uh, for once again another wonderful lunch lecture. Uh, Carl, once uh, we um, get the, uh, the, the, the video uh, from this, I will send it to Carl. Carl will do his magic editing and we will go ahead and put it up on YouTube. So if you got in late or if you wanted to share this with uh, any friends or family, it will live on our YouTube page. Thank you again, everyone. And thank you for your continued membership to the Howard County Historical Society.